So, Q&A for part one. So were one to get one done, how often should one get the test then? Uh, yes, at the last sequence I'll go through all that. Uh, re real quickly, if you have a very high score with significant disease, in 18 months or 24 months, you might want to check back in that what you're doing is working, right? And that two years later, you can say, okay, I've stopped my progression or slowed it. And if you get a low score like myself or Dr. Gerber, you know, maybe six, seven, eight, nine years later would be fine because you just need to check that nothing's gone wrong in the meantime. But on that point, this test, in the engineering world, we measure what you might think of as risk factors when we're making high volume devices. And we do measure risk factors, but we don't place too much stock in them. But in that engineering world, if we had a scanner, and we often do, that can actually tell if there's a problem with the part, not just guess based on the temperature or pressure, we would be using it wide scale, everywhere. And yet it's not used for humans, where their lives are at stake. So to me as an engineer, it's one of the most absurd things I've seen that this technology has been underused. Why not? Why, why is it? It's a long story. Uh, it's in the Widowmaker movie, which we have a version you can watch, and I'm going to use this again. Um, to give you a couple of quick little pointers, uh, one reason was when the technology came out, the cardiology world were shocked that it was being kind of delivered directly to the consumer. Uh, they began to advertise that you could come in and get a scan and cardiology doesn't allow stuff like that and they went crazy so that's one thing the kind of ivory tower another thing that was a big problem was the clinics were making a lot of money from invasive angiograms where you go in there's some risk involved but you go in and check for narrowings it's a huge money spinner and in the Mayo Clinic a project started they analyzed calcium scanning they discovered that they could actually have the number of their patients needing to go into the cath lab for an invasive um, procedure. And they were excited and management shut it down. And that's on the record because a third of their revenue came from the cath lab and they'd lose a half of a third of their revenue. So they shut the project down and that was mirrored in lots of uh, different facilities. The guys who invented it also went to the drug companies and said, hey, we have a test that can tell who's going to have a heart attack and it'll help you prescribe your drugs for those people. They did the analysis and every single drug company said no, forget about it, because we won't be able to sell the dro our drugs to the people who don't need them. And they knew that there was gonna be more people not getting drugs perhaps than where, and they want a blanket business, right? So that's just touching on some of the Widowmaker movie explanations. Um, it just did not suit anyone except the people, the individuals. Every major business interest was was not, you know, in love with it. Yeah, I think it's down mm. to uh, uh, the other thing is that these mm. car intervention cardiologists <coughs> control the agenda. And mm. you know, I, I remember saying to one cardiologist, he said, "You could identify those people most at risk." He said, they, "They're not my patients. I'm an intervention cardiologist. I spend 30 years training. I deal with sick people every day. I'm up at four o'clock in the morning." I'm there fixing people and their lives are being saved on a daily basis. So I just don't, I just don't think there has been the, the idea that individuals have the right to this information is alien to the industry, which is like other institutions we've seen who believe they should control the information flow down to the individuals and we decide the rules. I just wanted to ask, are there any countries where they use this uh, technique widely or much more widely than, than you're reporting about obviously America and here? Because here is no different from Britain. I'd say probably America is the leader where the technology was invented. It's only a hundred dollars approximately. It's used reasonably but not nearly as widely as it should. But America would be used more widely than, say, Ireland. Ireland docs will ask you, what is a CAC almost, you know? So America more so. A few years ago, a Texas senator brought forward a bill to the House to demand that this would be covered by insurance. And he actually won. And to the shock of the cardiology community, were absolutely outraged that it would be covered for anyone who wanted one. But he had enormous tragedy in his family. And he discovered about this, sort of what I'm telling you today. So he got it through. 
But there's big headwinds. I mean, this is a long, will be a long battle to put it back where it should be in the world. I mean, it will be. You might just say that space the president. Oh, yeah, an excellent point, David, and I usually use it. All astronauts and all presidents, potential presidents, must have a scan before taking office, and Air Force people as well now. So that'll kind of give you the answer. When you really got to know the health of the person, right, when it's important, they use the calcium scan. But for anyone else, well, you know, a few risk factors will do. Should only people, right? I'm being harsh there. It, it's the same as a mammogram or, or uh, all of those other preventative types of tests it, that it, we do. And we know they're not perfect, but they're yeah. better than not doing them. Exactly. The mammogram, in, in some ways, it's a good comparison, as David said earlier. Like, everyone's fine with mammograms to check. You should be fine with this. It's not so good a comparison in the sense that mammograms have, have limited capability compared to this. And, of course, heart disease and everything else that this shows is a much bigger killer in general. And it's a way better scan for effectiveness. You won't see figures like I showed you for a mammogram. They won't be within a mile of that. So... Yeah, it just makes the tragedy that calcification isn't used even worse. Interestingly, women during breast scans, sometimes they can see calcification of the arteries in the breast. And then sometimes good medicals will send them on to get a proper calcium scan because it'll show up even in the arteries of the breast. So, yeah. How accessible is it in Ireland? Ireland, it's, it's quite accessible. Uh, off the top of my head, the Hermitage in Lucan, uh, the Matter Private, Black Rock, and it's a place in Nace. But at ihda.ie, uh, there's a tab there with all the Irish centres. Do you have to be referred by a GP? Referred by a GP, yes. You do you have to be? Yeah. Most of America, you can walk in. Ireland is GP referral letter. So you need to go to the GP, get a letter, and then pick your centre. Um, Aviv, I believe, will cover it on some packages, but generally it's more cash out of pocket. How open are they to letting that happen? GPs? The GPs, uh, generally I hear they're open to it. At first they say the company line. They have no understanding of this generally, no disrespect to them, but they, they honestly don't because they're in a system which doesn't like it. But generally after you know, discussing, they'll, they'll say, okay. Uh, some are, are difficult. I've heard stories. But I don't have enough people in Ireland come back yet to really tell the average. But you'll always get a doctor who'll, who'll have a little more understanding, who, who'll give it to you. I've, heard, uh, I've had a test, and I'm not sure if there are tables available that would give you a good indication of risk based on age and score. There absolutely are. And in fact, if you Google uh, MESA, M-E-S-A, you will get the calculators where you can enter your statistics, age, sex, etc., and your score, and it will actually tell you instantly what percentile you are for risk. So it'll actually give both, both kind of risk, and it will also give where you are. If you're 50th percentile, you're like the average guy of your age. Obviously, David was up at 99th. Yes. Yeah. And a, a supplementary, if I may. The location and density of the, of the calcium, is that an important factor? The density is, and I wasn't going to get into the detail today, but just briefly, you've got... Okay, sorry. Yeah. No, well, it's a good one to bring up. It's just I always have to say, well, how far will I go? So the score is the Agaston sc score, which rolls up the amount of whiteness, the amount of calcium around your arterial uh, system, and also looks at the brightness of it. So how much density of calcium is there? So these two figures of volume and density go into the one rolled up Agatston score. And that's the only one they'll generally give you. But you can get the others. If you have a lower volume and a higher density for a given score, that's more stable plaque. Initial studies have showed that lower volume people with a relatively high density have got dense consolidated plaques that are quite stable. And people who have high volume relative to a, a not so high density could tend to have more soft plaque and less stable plaque. And as David pointed out, it's not the hard bony calcified plaque that actually tend to burst. Their presence tells you you got a shed load of really dangerous soft plaque under the water, but, but they don't burst. A lot of bursting occurs at the edge of calcification, where the calcification is weaker at the edge as it transitions to soft flesh and in soft plaque. 
So yeah, the calcium de uh, density volume can help better see your risk. But probably the key point is when you have a score is taking the action to stop it progressing generally. Because remember, a vast majority of people sleepwalk into their heart attack. They have no idea of what their score is. And that's probably the biggest tragedy. When you know, you can intervene. And when, you, when you're going to intervene, you need to find out the root causes and the best ones to tackle. That is true. <laughs> that's part two. Hi, Bruce. This is more a comment than a question. Um, it would seem to me that the, uh, the population of GPs are probably one of the most important groups to influence with this test and the fixes for it, rather than the surgeons who fix you when you arrive with a heart attack. Mm. Um, I, I just give you from what my own experience. Someone in my family went to their own GP being on heart medication and asked for this test, and the GP refused the test on the basis that from a risk perspective, you know, from framing him, that she didn't have, she wasn't high enough in the risk category, even though she had her on heart medication. <laughs> so if, if the GPs, uh, you know, if the GPs push back a lot on ordinary people, they won't, they won't progress it. And they never get the chance to fix themselves until they have a heart attack. So just how do we get, get to a state where it, this test is widely known and at least people can, be confident having a conversation with your GP about it. Yeah, no, that's a great point, uh, Emma, for sure. And I probably, if I speak louder, I can probably do without that. Does that work, pretty much? So, on that question, the, this is a project to get knowledge out there, and it's going to be, it's going to be a big project. Now, there's two tiers. There is getting out to the public who will work to demand the test is huge, especially in the modern world, you know, with the internet and everything's getting socialized and democratized. So getting out to the people is hugely important. But I agree, getting to the doctors is also very important. So it needs to be a two-hander. Now getting to the doctors is a little more difficult uh, because getting into forums where doctors congregate and getting a seat there is a challenge. We are making some movements on that and we are setting up a group of Irish doctors, uh, an initial kind of nucleus, which hopefully will expand. And that group, I, I can't get into disclosing or naming it yet, will become a centre of people who are expert in this and who can help with their colleagues. So that's something that's coming, it's just a little behind the general uh, kind of getting the message out. But, but I'd agree with you, we, we must convert the medical profession because they sit at the gates that said even if we didn't convert them I think most of them if people demand it not in your case but most of them will tend to allow it so it's getting to the people is still a huge huge part of this and, and we need to work on the doctors we have some doctors in the room I won't I won't expose them uh, but <laughs> I, I have a small bit of information on this and that um, I had a CAC score done recently, came up zero, so I'm very happy with that. But I have a whole bunch of friends who are quite overweight. And I mean, three or four weeks ago, I gave them all a present of this man's book. And I told them you're to read pages 265 to 271, which is a calcium score piece, and you're going to get that score done. And I gave it to them in front of their wives, and I said, you need to make sure that they do this. So at least they might start to actually recognize that I know their walking timelines. And I've been waxing on for years about the low carb, high fat stuff, and they think we're freaks, and they think you're whatever, but um, this is the one thing that might kick them into action. Yeah, and the other thing about this is you just cannot tell from the risk factors <laughs> that they love. They love the risk factors. Uh, I have a person who's 66 who spent the last 30 years he exercised a bit for sure, but so did David massively, and you had a huge score. That's one example. I have this 66-year-old who was very overweight for the last 30 years plus, and he came in with a zero at 66, right? I got a 29-year-old in the States who has a score of 650. He has the arteries of an 82-year-old, and he's slim, and he does exercise, but he admitted he ate a lot of junk food for the last 15 years, and his father died at 40 of a massive heart attack. So here's a 29-year-old with the arteries of an 80-year-old. Now he got the scan and he discovered, yes, I'm in serious trouble. But then myself and Dr. Gerber, of course, were able to help with him, go through all the things you need to do. And he went on a low-dose 
cholesterol lowering drug as well that stabilizes the disease in an advanced case like that it can be a belt and braces approach but but it's the lottery if you don't get the scan <laughs> there's no way you're going to know what's going on right until you drop dead or you have a major incident it's too late then mm. I, I, can i just make the point that having invested through the ihda i mean it's been i spent a lot of time on it so <coughs> Trying to make changes, it just takes so long. I mean, the resistance level has been unbelievable. All you're trying to do, I've no real interest, financial, all I think is people are right with information. They do a test, they take responsibility for that. The resistance has been, I'm not a doctor, how dare you question the system? We know best. And doctors are really busy dealing with patients on a non day basis. And I hope that people understand that they have to take responsibility for that. And over time, thankfully, I've had a number of people. One person who entered the test at all, and his is that name was actually ruptured on the day. He was dead in the MR. So there's been hundreds of stories. Over a million people have done the test in America since the widow. Additional tests have been done since the widow made the movie has been out. But it's only with Ivor and his intellect that is driving some of the change. And uh, you know, it's not going to be overnight success. And we hopefully. In 30 years time or 40 years time, it will just be, you know, it will be in place and people will see it 40, 45, they do the test once, women do it 55, and they understand the importance even before that of the right diet. I mean, low fat food, I live low fat. I mean, I drink sugar, <laughs> it was just like Disaster, yeah. And they, my, I have a huge network of, of medical doctors, professors, researchers all over the world, and they're coming back to me now with these scan results and there's a buzz de developing so this guy's coming back and i got this really overweight guy in his 50s and i was pretty sure you know we're gonna and i got a zero and then as a vegetarian right late 40s who's quite into fitness came back with a 360 had to sit him down and explain and he's just like it's like a kid with a new toy he said this calcification test it's showing me what's going on and there's excitement and i think that's what we need hopefully to reach a point where it gets around that wow this is a huge tool for us and now there are some people who are not crazy about it because some businesses benefit from fuzzy unclear technology you're not sure what's going on you're looking at murky risk factors better medicate them all to be safe so there are different people have different drivers um, and I mentioned the Mayo Clinic too so there are, there are headwinds for sure Right, okay, that's a good question. So the question was, oh, the mic, or it might be low on the module. But I'll just repeat, so what, is there a correlation between the calcification in the heart's arteries, the main coronary arteries, and the other arteries, like in the brain, or say the carotid, uh, and you know, in the neck? And interestingly, I know that calcification is picked up, uh, even in Egyptian mummies, in the, in the neck, and in, in people. But I haven't actually seen correlation studies trying to link the calcification of the coronary arteries from the standard CT scan of the, of the cavity that is CAC and scanning of the neck or the brain for calcification. They will correlate to a greater or lesser extent. The, uh, or the carotid intima medial thick, median thickness is an ultrasound of the neck that doesn't look for calcium but it looks for how thick the wall of the artery has become. And you can also use that ultrasound to look at the bulb in the carotid artery and try and judge is there plaque there from the thickness of a bulb feature. The reason I'm saying that is they've looked at calcification, CAC, versus the carotid ultrasound. And there's no comparison. The carotid ultrasound is a very weak predictor of events, even though it loosely would correlate with the calcification. It just seems that this scan of the heart gives overwhelmingly the best um, predictive power because it's looking right where the calcification most manifests itself. I guess. The driver as well, and the study of 25,000 people 12 years later showed those with male calcification, 99.6% were alive. Oh, yeah, that, that was for all causes. That's for stroke, heart attack, brain hemorrhage, Alzheimer's, you know. Oh, yes. 99.4%. So, 
Oh, yeah. that's funny. that's very low, either off to ten. If you not, it's mm. it's it's quite extraordinary. Yeah, and not to ten even is not quite nearly as good as a zero. Would you believe often they put one to ten? I'm not sure why they didn't do that here. Maybe it was too embarrassing and the zeros had like zero in the study and it was just too embarrassing to, to tell people that. But but yeah, this is all cause. Um, it will there are papers that link it to, you know, predicting certain cancers and other inflammatory diseases as well, because if you're driving these processes, you're doing a bad thing or many bad things and you're going to drive many bad outcomes beyond just heart disease. Okay. I wonder we should we wrap this first section and because we've another entire section with another Q&A coming up at the end of the next section. Well, we can circle back with more calcification questions at the end anyway. 